My name is Allison Hume, and I um, just want to thank you all for participating. We are really, really excited to be a part of Gray Anatomy and the Library's Retirement Boot Camp. So we're excited to bring a variety of providers to you and kind of working a tops to bottoms here as we go through and learn about the changes that occur as we age. So thank you so much. And um, we hope you enjoy all of the sessions. All right. Well, we will then uh, turn this over to Kathy, who will serve as our moderator for this afternoon. So Kathy, you can take it away. Okay. Thank you, um, Allison and Kathleen. Um, I am Kathy Hamilton. I call myself the retirement boot camp drill sergeant. Um, but I, uh, along with Kathleen, coordinate, curate and coordinate all the programs that we do um, throughout the year. Um, we are starting uh, today our Gray Anatomy series with Dr. Eric Herter. Um, full disclosure, Dr. Herter is my husband's doctor, and I happen to have seen a presentation very similar to the one that he will be giving you today. Um, Pre-COVID, I think it must have been four or five years ago. I don't know, Dr. Herter, but anyway, I found it very informative and reassuring, to be honest. So I am excited to be kicking off uh, this program with him and his presentation. Um, Dr. Eric Herter uh, did his undergrad at Boston College and graduated med school from KU Med or University of Kansas uh, Medical Center. Um, he's been with the Reed Medical Group since 1999. Um, his wife, Dr. Pamela Herter, is a family practitioner, family medicine practitioner um, here in Lawrence. And his brother, Luke Herter, is a hematologist oncologist also here in Lawrence. So there's a little Herter medical dynasty going on in town. Um, and we have the king with us today. So with, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Herter uh, with our thanks in advance for giving us your time today. We sure appreciate it. Oh Take God. it away. Thank you, Kathy, Kathleen, and Allison. And thanks everybody for joining. I am going to share my screen. So if, if people can't see that, please let me know. So um, see the, the topic today is dementia, but also memory loss uh, in general. Uh, dementia is a very uh, common condition. It's in the group of pat patients or people 65 and over one in nine will have some form of dementia. And if you narrow that group to 85 and over, one in three will uh, struggle with some form of dementia. Um, so I wanted to talk, uh, approach this topic. And as, as it was already stated, as questions come up, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll make sure I leave time. I plan to talk for about 40 minutes and then leave ample time for questions. Um, and also my slides have a lot of information. It's a very broad topic I wanted to at least touch the surface of a lot of areas, uh, but I'm not gonna necessarily read my slides. So if there are items on my slides that raise questions, please feel free to bring that up in the question and answer. And, and I can delve deeper into any topic as well, because it's, it's certainly not just a 40 minute topic. So let's see if I can get my slide to advance. Oh, there we go. I think, uh, especially with, with it being on Zoom, I put the slide, but I think really uh, Kathy covered most of this. So um, moving on. Um, so what is what is dementia and how to differentiate it from normal forgetfulness? That's That'll be the first part of the talk. And then touch a little bit on research in dementia uh, and part of why it's such a difficult condition to make progress with scientifically. The biggest part I wanna focus on is lifestyle prevention, the things that all of us can do at any phase in our life to prevent dementia or at the very least delay the onset. A lot of what success looks like with managing dementia is pushing it back. Uh, say if we had a crystal ball that told us that I was destined to start demonstrating dementia at age 80, if I can move that back to age 85, that can be a major victory in a way. And then finally touch on how we approach it as a medical problem, doctors and other healthcare providers, and then a little bit on integrative health management at the end if we have time. 
So the definition of dementia for any medical condition, just so if I, if a healthcare provider talks to a doctor in California, we want to have a set of criteria that we all agree on uh, that represent what would uh, be the features of that medical condition. And, and these are those features. Sometimes it might be helpful to start at the bottom of this list, not related to some other mental disorder. We may have known ourselves or family members to have a bad infection and we get really confused. And we see this in the hospital and understandably people think, oh my gosh, this is my new normal. But no, there are a lot of medical conditions that can cause transient brain dysfunction that goes away once that condition's improved. Uh, severe depression can be another. So the features we look for, of course, some sort of impairment of any of the major functions of the brain, whether that be short-term memory, uh, being able to use language at a high level. And of course, this doesn't mean just forgetting someone's name or forgetting a word, but a consistent uh, major issue with language. Executive function, complex attention, the things that make us more human, able to handle complex tasks. Um, and sometimes it can be things like social cognition, uh, all the, the norms of social behavior that we learned as a child and as a member of society. And then two other important features that there's declining abilities, that it's just not moment, moment in time where you have a bad day, but over time that we see it going down, and then it needs to cause dysfunction not just something that might be a curiosity, curiosity. that, oh, hey, uh, may have trouble in this realm, but that it's really making it hard for that person to function over time. So a common and understandable concern that gets raised when I see patients is, gosh, Eric, I'm forgetting my keys more often, or uh, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to find words. Does that mean I have early dementia? And the simple answer is, is no, though that sort of thing is normal with age. Um, just like all our functions as we age, you know, whether it be running up the stairs or our ability to function without sleep, our, our memory just doesn't work as well. And the medical term we use for that is memory glitches. Um, one analogy I've heard actually in my, <laughs> it's my wife's analogy, but is the idea of a memory tree. When we're 20, if you think of the trunk being our baseline memories and then the branches that branch out, it's easy to go down those branches to retrieve those memories. But when you're 70, those branches have gotten a lot longer. So sometimes it's just hard to get back down to the branches to find some of those memories. Um, so what really gets our attention? Uh, a big part of it is observers, family members, whether it be a spouse or children that have noticed repeatedly over time that their loved one may be demonstrating more serious issues with memory. A common one is, is repeat, repeating themselves. Uh, you know, they may say, oh, wasn't it great to see the Johnsons last night? And then 15 minutes later may bring it up again with no recollection that they'd already had that discussion. Uh, getting lost in familiar environment uh, say you've always gone to Hy-Vee for your groceries here in Lawrence, but then you or your family notice that you're sometimes you're getting lost going familiar places. Repetitive tasks, it may be as simple as making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Those are the sort of things that uh, really start to get our attention. And then a final point is just that last line is a lot of people with dementia do not have insight about their memory loss. And so just the fact that a patient may come in with concerns about their memory loss is already reassuring in a way because more often people that start to demonstrate true dementia really get kind of defensive because they don't have the insight that they're losing some of that brain function. But when we really think there might be something to be concerned about, that's when we start to use this diagnosis in the chart. And again, just to communicate with other health providers that we th this patient has mild cognitive impairment. We've noted that they're having some more significant troubles with brain function, but not enough that we would feel comfortable causing it, ca calling it dementia. The reassuring thing is when they look at patients with mild cognitive impairment, only about a third end up being diagnosed with dementia and around half of them actually improve. Um, and a big operational approach when people have mild cognitive impairment is to try to figure out what else could be zapping their brain energy. Are they not getting enough sleep or not good nutrition? Is it a medication side effect? A lot of things can, can zap our brains, especially as we get older. And, and sometimes identifying those and addressing them can make a big difference. 
So with that being said, let's touch on some of them, uh, especially the more common dementia syndromes, just uh, so you can have some recognition. Far and away, the most common is Alzheimer's disease. And sometimes this, the, name, the word Alzheimer's is used interchangeably with dementia. People may say, oh, my uncle had Alzheimer's. It may have been a different type of dementia, but it's just that common. And this is the more classic. And unfortunately, I'm sure most of us have known friends, family, loved ones that uh, have had Alzheimer's disease. And there's a fairly classic prevent, pre, uh, uh, I can't, uh, pre, 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 I can't think of the word, but where prog progression, yeah, yeah no jokes. Um, where um, people will go from just more mild intermittent memory issues, but then to where it can be increasingly disabling. And then it can start to even affect our our brain to where we have trouble moving and with continence. Um, and there, this is the one where there's the most understood from a genetic standpoint. There's this ApoE4 gene that's not terribly common, but it is a genetic link that uh, could explain some patients with Alzheimer's disease. Another fairly common type is dementia with Lewy bodies. Lewy bodies describe these changes in the brain that they call Lewy bodies. But it, it's, it's quite distinct from the Alzheimer's type. Uh, it's very volatile. People have good days and bad days with Lewy body dementia, especially early on. So on their good days, it, it may just be they're at baseline. But on their bad days, there can be a lot of trouble with movement, lightheadedness, and unfortunately, a lot of psychotic features too, almost like developing schizophrenia later in life. And sometimes that's the most uh, disabling and upsetting, understandably. Vascular dementia. Uh, so this, the symptoms look a lot like Alzheimer's, but it's people that have blood vessel disease. They may have had a big stroke or many little strokes, or just the effect of the poor circulation to the brain can cause changes in the brain cells that can look a lot like Alzheimer's. And sometimes it's a mixture of these more common types. Um, and then a type that's, that's not terribly uncommon, but fortunately not too common is frontotemporal dementia. And what that's distinguishing is that affects the more the, the parts of the brain and the front and the sides that have to do with personality and behavior more so than memory and organization. And so this will uh, can uh, lead to people having very bizarre behavior and they lose some of those inhibitions that we've learned about what's appropriate and inappropriate to, to do in, in public. But actually, a lot of times their memory is fairly good, uh, but their insight's not good. And so this, this can be another challenging type. And then just, and then finally, Parkinson's disease, which is common in its own right. In its later stages, uh, patients can develop some dementia features, but it's not so much memory, but it's more executive function and being able to manipulate their environment. And so that's an unfortunate combination because with Parkinson's, you already have trouble with balance, but then losing some of that insight to be able to plan around and uh, prevent falls and other uh, mishaps can be impaired. And then there's several other types that are much less common. I just list them here for completeness sake. So how do we make the diagnosis? Uh, Understanding understandably, a lot of times people come in and say, I'm worried about dementia and my loved one, can we do some tests? Really, the tests we do are to rule out other causes. To date, there's not any discrete test that can diagnose dementia. Really, the only way you could make it for sure would be to do a brain biopsy, which we don't do. And so a lot of the testing is to rule out other causes, to make sure they're not anemic or have low thyroid function, make sure they don't have bleeding or a tumor in their brain that could affect the symptoms. And from there, it's a clinical diagnosis. Usually, we never would really do it in one visit unless it's severe, but watching over time to see if it fits with dementia as we exclude other causes. And a lot of this is done with input from loved ones and friends that, that can give us those observations from the field. Often, we will utilize cognitive testing, brain testing, where people go through a series of questions you know, to test their memory. Uh, but those are not especially in early stages are not great uh, because sometimes highly educated people uh, um, or people that are just sharper in general can 
do a lot better than you would expect on those or vice versa. So. With dementia, what's happening? Certainly don't wanna get into uh, too deep, but the basic thing we see is shrinkage of the brain. So naturally you would think, well, can't we just do a scan then and see if the brain looks shrunken and that can make the diagnosis. But all of us, our brains shrink as we get older, just like a lot of parts of our body. So it's not distinctive enough that we can make the diagnosis. Um, but at the cellular level or the microscopic level, you'll see these tangles and plaques, especially in Alzheimer's disease. And for years, it was thought that those tangles and plaques were the cause of Alzheimer's type dementia. Uh, but in recent years, it's been more evident that they may just be a result of some other change taking place because efforts to attack the tangles and plaques really don't seem to make a difference. So just a, a little bit about research and our current understanding. Um, we have a long way to go, unfortunately. And, and there's a lot of excuses, so to speak, for why that is. Uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity uh, amongst types of dementia. Uh, and so it's hard when you, when you come up with uh, trying to look for unique clues uh, or unique treatments to see that it makes a difference because of that variability. Um, it's also hard because it's a slow moving disease and, and they've never really found a great animal model. A lot of the thought leaders in the field also think that it may just be that dementias are due to multiple variables. You know, it could be due to genetics and diet and environment. And so if you try to just focus on one, you're not able to see or make a difference, but um, hopefully more progress, you know, but there's been progress nonetheless, and going to talk a lot as we come up about what has been learned. This is a bit of a busy slide, but it's an important concept as we talk about things that we understand to try to uh, prevent or delay dementia. So I want to start on the bottom part of the slide, and I don't know, I guess my arrow doesn't show up. Oh yeah, there it is. If you can see my arrow around that word apoptosis. Apoptosis our cells are all programmed to be able to go into apoptosis, which just means programmed cell death. And it's really useful because if there are parts of our body where the cells are no longer needed, those cells will die off so they're not zapping resources. And so the idea with dependence receptor mediated brain loss is just that it's the thought that the brain cells, if they don't see a healthy enough environment, they go into accelerated cell death. And it's thought that that might be one of, one of the reasons we know of so many keys to delaying dementia, that is keeping, making sure the brain knows that it's still a healthy environment and it gets those signals rather than doing cell death. Hey, we need brain cells. We need you to stay healthy and stay around. You know, everything's still good. And, and, and so, and that'll, that is a central theme to what I'm gonna talk about with all these little things people can focus on to help keep their brain healthy. On the left, I just, as an analogy, I have a little seedling or a sapling that's starting to grow. And, and they're the same way. They need to, as they grow, see that they're in a healthy environment. They need to see sunlight and optimal temperature and water. Uh, and if they don't, we know what they do. They wither and die because they say, hey, conditions are not optimal. We're not going to uh, waste resources in this, in this part of the garden. And so that's kind of the concept is trying to keep our brain garden healthy uh, as we go forward for our betterment. And just as an aside, I made a, a side note, which is secondary is just the threats. And that's another, just with this analogy, you can also think of things like smoking and uh, obesity and things that can also be a threat to that healthy brain garden. So hopefully not too uh, mealy mouthed a uh, slide, but I thought it was important. Um, and as I've already sort of touched on with managing our memory and dementia, it, it may be that at a certain point we can only do so much, but so much of the benefit is delaying the worsening. Uh, so that, you know, I already made that point. If it's destined for 80, that maybe we can delay it till 85. A big part of how we do that is to, to try to keep, just like building up our fitness so we're less likely to fall, if we can if we can do all the things that keep our brain as fit as possible, it's going to take more insults, more deterioration to cause a meaningful deficit. And so that's the idea with cognitive reserve. 
And then finally, just the, a, a nice uh, unifying message is that what's good for the heart is good for the brain. Uh, and so whether we're talking about exercise and healthy diet, but also good cholesterol control, good uh, blood pressure control, if you have diabetes or early diabetes, doing what you can to control that, and all the other things that are good from the heart, from good oral health, from good sleep. So there, it's nice that basically you can, if you're focusing on preventing heart attacks and strokes, you're also helping reduce your risk of dementia. So let's get into some of the lifestyle measures we can focus on, again, in that spirit of doing lots of little things to keep our brain healthy. Um, and I put this Whitehall cohort slide up here just because a lot of this information is gleaned from population studies. Population studies are what they sound like, where they take big groups of people and, and study what they can learn from that group. And a lot of these have been followed for decades. Probably the most famous in the United States is the Framingham cohort in Massachusetts. I think it was around 1950 they started following people. And then they, you know, they follow their blood work and they do interviews over time. And that way they can say, okay, in this group, how did all these different factors translate to different health conditions, whether it be cancer or heart attack? And of course, with this talk, we're talking about dementia. And so in 2017, they did a follow-up and presented some of this information. And I know people can read the slide, but uh, just to quickly go through, they found that people were more likely to develop dementia if they did not get as much education early in life, if they had hypertension, obesity, and hearing loss, especially if they were untreated in midlife. And then after 65, these features, smoking, depression, being socially isolated, not getting exercise or, or diabetes. So that's just one example of where we glean some of this data. And, uh, and there's, I mean, there's multitudes of of other studies, but this was just one example as we go through this data. So, so I'm, I'm, I know it's a long list of these 10 items in lifestyle, but I'm just gonna sort of quickly go through. And again, like I said, at the end, if people want me to uh, expound on any of these topics, I'm happy to do so. Uh, I saw some of my patients in the crowd and so they probably know, I always like to start with exercise because I think if, if people could only push well, one wellness button, thank goodness we can push them all or try to, I, I would start with exercise um, because across the board, observationally, and I've seen it with my own patients, I, I've never had a patient come in and say, Eric, boy, I started exercising more and I feel lousy. You know, it, it makes us feel good today and it, it's good for our body. And, and there's a lot of evidence to support the fact that people that exercise more like develop dementia at least later than they would, ha would have otherwise. Um, and again, I don't want to say it over and over, but that heart-brain connection, of course, comes in here as well. As an extension of exercise, also exercising the brain is important. Um, like the Whitehall cohort, there have been, uh, there's a lot of research showing that they, the more highly educated people are, they, they have a lower rate of dementia, or at least it's later in life. Um, of course, with the cognitive reserve theory, keeping the brain as healthy as possible, so it takes more to knock it off its course. But in recent years, uh, as, as they look at this more, they do find that it needs to be challenging. Um, you know, I, 15 years ago, you might recommend to a patient, we'll do more word puzzles to try to re reduce your risk of dementia. But if those things are more rote and routine, it might not be as helpful as learning a new language or trying to learn a new skill like playing a, a musical instrument. Um, and so if you really want to focus on this cognitive reserve theory, sometimes you want to make sure it's, it's something especially challenging. And at the bottom, I just put some websites because of this fact. There are a lot of websites out there that provide, uh, you know, exercises to try to achieve this goal. This was a study that looked at this question as well. And they, and what, what they found is if people just tried to practice memorizing things, they didn't see that that really helped with brain health or dementia prevention. But if you really worked on challenging your speed of processing or reasoning, as you can see, they did find more benefit. Sleep, uh, sleep is uh, definitely important. Uh, you know, from all the research on sleep apnea and sleep studies, we know that of so many changes that go on through the sleep cycles that help to restore our brain cells for the next day. 
And then even found that the brain seems to shrink during good quality sleep. And so these fluids flush the brain and uh, they think that that may even contribute to those, the brain cells staying healthier. And then beyond just focusing on really prioritizing good sleep uh, is the question of sleep apnea as well, which uh, also carries a, an increased risk for dementia later in life. Emotional distress is another adverse factor for the brain. And so, uh, you know, if, if you have a stressful lifestyle or conditions like depression or anxiety, uh, of course, for quality of life today, it behooves you to, to take steps to try to address that, uh, but also to try to help keep your brain healthy for now and the future, especially. Um, a lot of the things we've already talked about, like prioritizing sleep and exercise are also good to help with, um, with emotional distress. Um, and it's thought that, uh, like a lot of things that put stress on the body, it increases inflammation and that inflammation can also be toxic to the, to the brain cells. So, and of course, for some of these things, we think about medication and I put that question mark as a segue to the next slide, because there's also when they do uh, review of medical records with computerized medical records, one of the great advantages is you can ask the computer to say, hey, look back at all the people that took these medicines and then look at their conditions. And when they do those deep dives, they find that patients, especially if they take things like Valium in that family, they seem to be more at risk for dementia later in life. And so we want to work even harder to avoid those medications if possible. Now, a logical conclusion or Theory along with that, though, is, well, maybe those people took more Valium when things in that family because they had more of that emotional distress we talked about on the last slide. And then certainly that might be part of the connection. Of course, with healthy lifestyle, we want to talk about diet. And as an area of positive focus, uh, you know, I, you know, thinking about it, our body and our brain cells love nutrition. And one of the best ways to get a lot of nutrition is to eat a wide variety of plant-based whole foods. And there's a million diets out there, as we all know, but if you look at the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet, even, even like paleo and ketogenic, really, if you really dig into their recommendations, it's, it's to eat mostly plants and things that fall outside that category, don't eat as much of it, you know, whether it's meats and, and certainly less healthy foods like processed foods, snack foods, excessive sugars. Along with that, we know that uh, neurons, brain cells, especially thrive with healthy oils like omega-3 oils and some of the um, other not saturated fats, but the unsaturated. Um, and I listed some of them like the nut oils and olive oil. Um, again, of course, the heart brain connection comes in there. And, and then I wanted to touch on the idea of insulin resistance. Uh, because it is an important concept in the literature, they find that developing insulin resistance is toxic to the brain and it does accelerate dementia. Insulin resistance is the state that leads to type two diabetes. And a lot of it is a function of the SAD diet. You may have heard that term, the standard American diet, where unfortunately a lot of people eat a lot of convenience food, junk food. Um, and so again, focusing more on predominantly plant-based whole foods is good to reduce the uh, tendency towards insulin resistance. Really, this ties in with a lot of the topics we've all already talked about, but it's, it's easy to query the records to see that patients with obesity do have a, a higher risk of dementia, especially obesity in you know, the middle of life. And so one more incentive to, you know, to try to do your best. And from a medical standpoint, I know culturally, sometimes people think about obesity and they're like, well, I want to look like the person in the magazine. But from a medical standpoint, we see benefit, even if people can, if they have excess body weight, even losing 5% can make a big difference as far as moving the needle with risk factors. So alcohol. So this, I think it was 2019, that same Whitehall cohort, and I didn't mention that's out of England, the Whitehall cohort, but they published more data because they had they'd notice this connection with dementia. Um, of course, one of the key words with wellness is moderation. And we see this with the heart too, but that is drinking a little bit of alcohol seems to be healthy for the 
brain, and the heart. It doesn't mean, you know, we would never encourage people necessarily to drink alcohol if they don't want to, or certainly if they have problems otherwise with alcohol. But then also, as we see with the heart, drinking more than two drinks per day, it shifts back over into the unhealthy uh, category. Probably not surprising because of the heart-brain connection, but tobacco is not good for the brain. It does accelerate the risk of dementia. It more than doubles it. Uh, and the more you smoke, the, the more the risk goes up. And the two final lifestyle factors I wanted to talk about are a little more unique to the brain. I mean, certainly social connectedness is good for our bodies and our well-being in general, uh, but there's a, there seems to be even more evident, more compelling evidence when it comes to brain health and reducing the risk of dementia. Um, and I, I, on, on the picture here, you can see I put these, these five areas of the world known as the blue zones. Uh, and in the blue zones, there are areas that they've identified where people live to 100 more often and they, they make it to 100 a lot healthier in general than other parts of the world, including with a lower rate of dementia. And one commonality to these areas is they, have a, they all have a really tight sense of community. They feel more fulfilled in general and they feel more tightly connected to each other. Um, and as you may recall on the Whitehall cohort slide, social isolation, especially later in life, is associated with dementia. And it's one of many factors where those, those happiness hormones, so to speak, can flood that brain garden and tell those, those brain cells, give more of them a signal that, no, we don't want you to, to die off. We want you to stick around. The question about confounded variable, uh, you know, it's fair, certainly, but you know maybe it's the other way around that people less at risk for dementia are more prone to stay connected. But I think I still think there's enough evidence supporting this that it's important to focus on doing what we can to stay fulfilled. Um, and part of that is part of that connectedness is with oneself because I know a lot of my patients, since this is retirement boot camp, with retirement, you know, sometimes that when you retire, it's great, but it's, it's easy sometimes to feel less fulfilled. And, um, and so I think it's important to go into that and actively seek out things to, to keep engaged. And then finally, this ties right in with the brain garden concept is our brain is an input output organ. It takes in what we see and hear and taste and it processes it and the thinking part of the brain, then it tells us how to react. And so we want the input to be as good as possible, you know, whether it's staying stimulated, like we talked about with brain exercise, but also doing everything possible to take good care of your oral health, your eye health, ear health, and your other sensory organs. So now that I've touched on a lot of the little things that are within all of our control to, to help with brain health, the latter part of the talk just wanted to touch on uh, medical management to, just to have a, a cursory understanding of how we have a focus uh, uh, as healthcare providers. Um, of course, the biggest thing is thinking of trying to identify things we can slow use to slow the decline in brain health, certainly manage some of the contributory medical conditions. Again, what's good for the heart's good for the brain. So we wanna keep taking good care of blood pressure, et cetera. Improve brain resilience. That just means to focus on nutrition, sleep, all the other things that help keep the brain healthy and then manage associated symptoms. Um, so on the drugs to slow the decline, there's now there are three, a third one just came out, but the main two have been in this class. I'm not gonna read the slide to you, but I, in question and answer, I can expound if people have questions. And, and this is just a graph from one of the many studies done with this combination of drugs. You can see here where it says Namenda and Dinepazil with these open circles. And in the graph, you can just see there's a modest improvement and slow and decline compared to the placebo group with the nepazil. So that's, that's kind of the standard that we see. I've been in practice long enough to see these drugs in action, and I think they're worth using with patients with dementia, but it, it just really slows the decline. It doesn't unfortunately make things a lot better in most cases. Aducanumab is the new drug that just was approved this year. Uh, Suffice it to say, it's been controversial. Uh, there was mixed feelings on the FDA panel whether it should be approved, but they approved it anyway. Uh, and, and the studies really have been 
uh, plus minus is whether it makes a benefit. And so I, I'm not gonna spend any more time on it unless there are other questions. Did wanna to touch on psychiatric features. Uh, the patients with, I'm doing a talk, sorry. Zoom talk. <laughs> About this okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, sorry about that. Um, so with, with any brain disorder, people are very prone to psychiatric changes, whether it be strokes or brain tumors. The changes in the brain also change a lot of the chemistry that can affect our emotion. Um, in addition, uh, with dementia, especially people can be prone to psychotic features. And some of this any of us, if we can't make sense of things cognitively, it's easy to start thinking the worst, especially if you are depressed and have negative emotions. And so pe patients with dementia are very prone to delusions and hallucinations. And sometimes for loved ones, that can be one of the most challenging features. Uh, sometimes treating that depression can help. So at least those uh, false ideas aren't as negative and upsetting. Um, Another contributor can be delirium. I think all of us have known, you know, if we feel sick, sometimes you toss and turn. Well, in dementia patients, that can rise all the way to uh, also hallucination, psychosis, or agitated behavior because they, again, they can't make sense of why they're feeling so poorly. Uh, sometimes the most common reason for that in a dementia patient is a bladder infection. So, so with that, that psychosis, that can look a lot like like schizophrenia features almost, sometimes we have to think about medications in dementia patients. We absolutely try to avoid it, except as a last resort. But sometimes if that's the feature that's keeping patients uh, or is leading to patients maybe needing to think about moving to a nursing home, we'll, we'll use it. And it's an important topic when we talk about patients with more advanced dementia. So that's why I mention it. Just briefly, because I see it's 442, with advanced dementia, just some other medical issues that we have to commonly manage are, are the ones listed here with hygiene and appetite and incontinence. And with that, when patients have dementia and they're trying to stay at home, uh, caregiver strain can be such a, a huge and important issue to understand if you have a loved one for, with dementia or set especially as healthcare providers, because a lot of times the biggest health risk factor for that patient with dementia is if their caregiver gets sick. And this can be exhausting in ways that can't even be imagined. I've, you know, I've, I've seen it, I haven't lived it personally, but another, just something very important to be aware of. So I feel like it's, it's uh, less than 20 minutes to the hour. So I, I'll just sort of mention these things and I can go back to it more in Q and A, but the integrative health approach can really mean two things. A lot of what I've already talked about is integrative health, because not only do we want to look at the medications and the testing, but we want people to work on optimizing sleep and nutrition and exercise and all the things that integrate to help the brain stay as healthy as possible. But there are integrative health providers or uh, functional medicine providers, naturopaths, that really that's the biggest part of their focus, especially through uh, nutrition and monitoring toxicities in the environment. And, and I bring it up not because that's necessarily my focus, but I want to work collaborative with, collaboratively with patients. And I think it's under, important for people to understand with conditions that there's, there's a lot of ways that you can approach it as part of this collaboration. And I've mentioned some of the common areas of focus with this. And like I said, it's a lot of it has to do with the gut and supplements and diet and and I've listed a bunch of them here, and, and I, I can pop back to the slide in a minute if people want to expound on any of the specifics. Uh, I think gluten and dairy avoidance are self-explanatory. Medium chain triglycerides, that's just a type of, um, of oil or fat that's, that's really easily, it's a really good nutritional source for all the bacteria that live in our gut. Um, AGEs, advanced glycolation end products, that's when you, what you get like when you char ribs with sauce on it. So sugar with protein and it gets charred. And there's, there's evidence to suggest that that could be toxic. And so that's another area, of one, one of many areas of focus. And the mercury and seafood, we know that fish oil is good for you. So SMASH just stands for sardines, mackerel, anchovies, salmon, and um, what's the H? It's the one they eat in Scandinavian countries. Um, 
herring. herring. Thank you. I heard somebody say it. <laughs> so anyway, so the, the point being that especially uh, trying to especially focus on those for your fish oil sources, is just because those are less likely to have the mercury that can be toxic sometimes if you get a lot of other fish. A broad over a broad generalization that I can expound on if people have questions. And then finally, two other things. Uh, some there are hormone specialists, and uh, they might sometimes they would suggest the brain would be healthier if we're more pushy with hormone supplementation. Again, I'm not advocating for that, but I think it's fair to know that there are uh, some th some uh, health providers that you know could also provide that consideration. And then the idea of black mold and uh, some some uh, environmental bacteria and toxin exposures, including having old fillings where the evidence is kind of shaky. But again, I think it's only fair that patients be aware of that level of consideration. So, so in closing, the whole talk was really about the integrative health approach, you know, doing all those little things that are good for us in so many ways, including for our brains um, and, and doing it no matter what phase of life we're in, you know, doing, you know, even if, you know, some of my patients are in their 30s and you think you can get a lot away with it, you know, because of that cognitive reserve theory, it really pays to, you know, long term healthy habits. And, and though, although treatment and management at a medical level are challenging and lacking, you know, there's so many things we can do to, to at least delay the onset if nothing else. And sometimes that really can make all the difference. So with that being said, I will take any questions. We've got one already uh, from the Altmans, and you did touch on uh, some supplements back there, but are, are there any actual known, is there any actual known medical value to memory supplements we see on TV, such as Prevagen? Yeah, it's, it's unknown. Um, the, um, yeah, there are a lot of them, and there's a lot of them stem from uh, sort of bench science or lab science where they say, oh, well, if we do this, the brain cells are happier. Now that happens in medicine a lot. And then if they finally save up enough money, which costs a lot of money to do a real evident, to do a real randomized controlled trial, a lot of times those things don't pan out. The reality is a lot of these supplements may just not have the capital like that a company like Pfizer may have. And so they may, they may never be able to prove it. Um, and most of them are safe. And so what happens with a lot of my patients is I just say, you know, probably best we know there's no risk other than to your pocketbook and it's okay to try and sort of do your own trial. And if you, feel, you or your family feel like there's, you see a benefit, then, you know, then stick with it. I mean, that's not a great answer, but that's about the best we can do without really high level studies. Okay. I will say as a final point, though, especially after things have been out for a while, there are things that come out that seem to help, um, you, know, you know, with various conditions, and it doesn't stay a secret. And so if something's been out for a long time, but, uh, you know, there's never been major publications or reports of great benefit, then I would expect the, the benefit would be modest at best. Okay, here's another question from Angie. What do you think of statins for infl inflammation, not hypercholesterolemia? I, I do think, yeah, absolutely. They are, they are demonstrated to reduce uh, inflammation in the lining of the artery. And as I mentioned in, in some slides, we know that that sort of inflammation can also be toxic to the brain. And so it, that, and so it makes sense that statins could be have a preventive benefit in that way. Now there are a subset of people that are, are really smart, um, including some high-level thought leaders that think that statins also, while they have that benefit for the brain, there's a potential toxic effect to the way they they affect cellular metabolism, and so we don't see that with very many specialists where they would just start a statin for uh, memory protection alone. Yes, if someone has already had three strokes, we know that statins can help reduce that and if they have vascular dementia, but because of the balance of benefit, but also concerns, we don't use them primarily for that purpose, if that makes sense. It does. Um, it, I have a question. It dawned on me when you were talking about both stress uh, and isolation or depression, isolation, stress, anxiety, 
all making this worse or perhaps the if you had early dementia would it progress faster in times of say a pandemic when for two years we were under a lot of stress our brains weren't functioning at least mine wasn't normally you know there was a lot of isolation um you know do, do those kinds of un unusual conditions advance dementia those environmental Abs I, you know i guess i can't say absolutely but i'd almost say absolutely and yeah. in fact uh i saw that unfortunately in a lot of my patient, patient uh, patients with dementia during the pandemic uh and i think it's it's at least twofold uh as i sort of mentioned when patients have already have dementia, a lot of our focus is trying to help with all those things that help with brain reserve, make the, the brain more resilient so that they can function as highly as possible despite their limitations from dementia. And so losing that stimulation from social contact and a variety of settings, et cetera, really impacted people. But even beyond that, I, I, I felt like a lot of people that were more borderline, uh, a higher percentage of them seemed to progress during the pandemic so yeah i believe it um okay uh paula you said how about more dementia in back of brain than frontal i'm not sure that's in the form of a question do you want to open up your mic you're welcome to okay paula. yes i just didn't take time to spell it all out my mother had a dementia that when you said the other the more common one is more the frontal where they're maybe behavior i mean there are appearance or something you were saying my mother's was that she she stayed very perky and active and she looked nice it's just that mentally and the, they said it was the more the back of the brain i think that she could not understand she lost her understanding and making sense of letters pictures i see well and yeah the and the most the back the frontal the frontotemporal dementia is not the more common type the more common type is more in the, the hippocampal region, but uh, yeah, there, I mean, there are a lot of other types of dementia. I mean, there's some that are, that are more uh, a, just, which are just pure language, they're uh, aphasias. So I'm not sure if your mom may have had a, a more rare type that just affects the ability to process or process speech, um, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, the frontotemporal is the one that's that's less common, but usually their memory is pretty good. Uh, but you know, in a word, they just develop very bizarre personalities and behavior because of the this condition's effect on their brain. Okay, uh, for the last five minutes or so, if you have a question that you would just like to ask, um, just go raise your hand. If your video is on, if your camera is on, I can see you. Um, I have to just flip back and forth. But if you have a question, or I think I think it would be probably, okay, uh, go ahead and just unmute yourself then. Um, I think um, Jean Klein has a question. Jen, yeah, Jen. Jen. Okay. Jen. Um, my question is, uh, as a single person, uh, what sorts of symptoms could I look for um, I'm, you know, I'm not saying I'm socially isolated. I'm, I'm obviously I connect with friends, but the friends don't know me or see me as often as I see myself. So what, what sorts of symptoms might I be on the lookout for? Uh, you know, one, uh, daily tasks, uh, if, uh, you know, sometimes managing, fine, managing the household or finances, if, you know, if you, uh, of course, sometimes everything can get a little more challenging, but if that seem dramatically more challenging. Um, Visio spatial, that is trying to find your way around town. You know, if it occurred to you, gosh, that's that's unusually, you know, I really have to focus so much harder or, or sometimes really have to stop and uh, recollect myself. Uh, I, you know, I, I've noticed in my patients that are, are single, uh, you know, friends, uh, a lot of times it is friends that, that call it to my attention. Um, but unfortunately, uh, often it's, it seems to be, yeah, they call, they, they pick up on it at a more advanced state sometimes than, uh, uh, someone, you know, that has, uh, uh, that lives with someone or, um, or might have family that's more, you know, more uh, connected for, for whatever reason. So, 
Anybody else? Oh, what about new hopeful research is going on? Or what new hopeful research is going on now and where is the research being done? Oh gosh, uh, there, I mean, there are tons of ongoing uh, trials, um, you know, and really it's being done everywhere, including, you know, KU Med Center is a research center for dementia. Their, their area of focus is exercise. And I've had patients enroll in studies, you know, and they'll do, but a lot of their research is trying to uh, get more granular with the understanding of, because we feel pretty sure exercise is helpful, but to get more granular so that it could be more prescriptive what people could do to delay early onset dementia. Um, and a lot of things looking at lifestyle. I think one of the branching areas is this multi, uh, multiple variable approach. Um, I think anybody online that's had any connection with science knows that good experiments, you just change one variable. And so some big thought leaders in the field, uh, a lot of them are starting to push that. And that's why I, I showed that really busy slide with the, with the apoptosis, um, this theory that will, despite typical research where we just change one variable, we've got to look for creative ways to change multiple variables. Cause it may be, I mean, just make something up. Say we, you know, we say we're going to give people uh, Tic Tacs and see if they get less dementia. Well, maybe they really need Tic Tacs and sweet tarts. And so if you just do one, <laughs> I mean, it's a very simplistic example, but they, you know, they've put together very elegant explanations for why that might be the case. And so I think that holds a lot of promise, you know, uh, looking at it from that standpoint. Um, as far as drugs, I, I don't know. You know. There's been a shift. This newest drug has been around for a long time in development to attack the plaque. But unfortunately, there have been other drugs that attack the plaque and tangles to try to diminish them. Um, but we're learning that the plaque and tangles may not be the cause because these drugs that can achieve that, that aim are not proving to really make a, a, a big difference for patients because we don't care what the brain looks like. We want people not to have dementia. So, okay. Um, this is a perfect last question, especially for a library program. Can you recommend <laughs> a good basic book or website with scientifically sound evidence regarding healthy lifestyle aspects, diet, supplements, et cetera? Well, the, I mean, the, the Alzheimer's Association has a lot of great resources online. I mean, usually I'm focused on that with my caregivers, especially, you know, for resources. Probably the most popular, and it's a really good book of recent years, is The End of Alzheimer's by Dr. Dale Bredesen. Um, and he, it's an amazing book. I, it, and it touches on, and in fact, it's, you know, a lot of what uh, I talk about, uh, you know, is covered there just because I think it's just a great synopsis of all the, uh, of the fairly current, it's, it's probably three or four years old now, um, research on, on dementia and extensive lifestyle uh, coverage. So yeah, so I, I would highly recommend that book. I will caution not from me but from other neurologic thought leaders they think maybe he goes a, he's a bit too bold because uh, he his book does make the point that he thinks it can be completely prevented and eliminated and the great majority in my experience of experts in the field of dementia don't think that's too bold a statement um, but nonetheless I mean when you're talking about healthy lifestyle for the most part um, I think 90 to 95 percent of the things he recommends, are things like I talked about that are good for us anyway. So I, that, that by far, I think that would be the best book that I'm aware of in the most recent years. Yeah, the end of Alzheimer's. Yeah, I, I can put it in the chat. So, okay, that yeah, the author's name Kathleen is. Um, oh, LPL has the end of Alzheimer's, and she's put the link to the book on our website. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I don't think I, I think it might be EI instead of IE. I typed too quickly, but okay, yeah, okay. he's a he's a uh, dementia specialized neurologist at the University of uh, San Francisco. You know, which or yeah, UCSF, which is one of the best you know hospitals hospitals in the in the country. So great. Yeah, you might just want to make a note of that before you leave uh, the room today. Just it's over there on the chat. Got the chat open. 
And with that, um, oh, Margie Coggins says, I have found How to Be Well by Lipman to be helpful for general health lifestyle info. Thank you, Margie, for that. Appreciate it. And we appreciate you, Dr. Herter. Yes, uh, thank pleasure. you. This is excellent. Um, and uh, again, we did record this and it will be posted on our YouTube uh, channel, Lawrence Public Library. And then we have a retirement boot camp playlist that you can find from the Lawrence Library page. Um, so if you'd like a direct link, just let us know. We can send that out to you. I'm going to look at it again because I, I missed some stuff and I want to look at that supplement list too, especially Ashawanga. Ashawan, how do you pronounce that? Oh, the herb? I, I'm not sure, yeah. Is that good or bad? Was that on your good list or your bad list? That's on the good, yeah. The, oh, one yeah, of the I've read some many, interesting. Yeah, and there's a lot of them. And and again, to be clear on, on that, I'm not endorsing those things, but I think I it's good for, I like my patients to know about it. And then, you know, you can work collaboratively with your doctor to say, hey, you know, I, I like the idea of this. Do you think it's harmful? I, you know, because the almost almost all of that can be done very safely but again i don't <laughs> i don't want people yeah. to go out and add all those supplements saying oh i think he said to add all this stuff no yeah no we un we understand that but i'm glad you clarified well let's give yeah. uh the doc a round of applause hey. uh, oh, we've unmuted we're unmuting thank you thank you that was thank great you. Thank, thank you so you. much thank you thank you thank you thank you have a good evening um sure